We're going to have an incredible weekend. This is just the beginning. I'm going to go ahead and bring up Pastor Shaddy Solomon from Orlando, Florida. Everyone give it up for Pastor Shaddy Solomon. After Shaddy shares, it's going to be incredible. We're going to have Pastor Tom Breckwall share, and it's going to be an incredible night. You guys stay with it. This is just the beginning of this weekend. Is Pastor Shaddy in the room? There you go, right here. Everyone give it up for Pastor Shaddy. It's great to be back in Campus Harvest. This is the best campus harvest in the whole world. How many of you, you know, there's many of them around the country. But this is where things happen in a big way, right? This is where all the world changer. If you're a world changer, let me hear you. Uh, here we go. That's a world changer right there. All right. Grab your seat. I want to share with you a story. And it's a real story. Truth story. Easter 2010. The Lord led us to start a church right at Lake Mary High School. And um, God led us there and we believed God that something's going to happen amazing. We were on a, one of these church plans that's maybe not having much hope because we only have a team of 15 people and very under budget situation. But we believed God for a miracle. When we launched in April 2010, right in July 2010 was the world conference now how many of you you know that we're a part of a worldwide family from around the world it's called every nation and our church in Manila it's like like a uh, hundred million people by now but anyway it's at, at the time it was 50,000 people huge big church and this the these are the people who were hosting the world conference it was my first world conference to go to so I flew to Manila and I start seeing what is it like to see God doing something beyond man. I start seeing how is it really people could make the difference in other people's life through the message of Jesus, through discipleship. Over this time, I watched that and in our flight back, see in a flight there, Manila is far away, you know, it's far. It's the other side of the world in the Philippines. And um, we, we flew there from LA, it's 14 hours flight straight. And it was me and another guy. And to our bad luck, we got the last roll of the plane by the bathroom. And now if you flew international, you know they have like four seats in the middle, two seats to this side, and two seats to this side. So if we find ourselves in the middle roll of four, and we're right in the middle. So I thought that's great. Right before the plane took off, two brothers who are sumo wrestlers, they have uh, the other seats, one from this side and one from this side. So me and another guy, we got, you know, squished 14 hours by two sumo wrestlers sitting right next to us, you know. You know, after a couple hours, you start smelling other people's breath and stuff like that. So I was praying, God, is, is this the best way we could get to Manila? But we got there, and the whole time there, I was praying, Lord, speak to me. How do you want us to make disciples in Lake Mary. I saw what God could do. I witnessed that. And I encourage you, if you ever get it around our international conference, you need to go to see what God can do in another nation. In the way back, my wife met me there, and in the way back, we got upgraded to first class. Now, if you know anything about first class international, it's really cool. It's like $10,000 a ticket, of course, you know. I will never give that on my own, but if God goes before you, He makes a way. So we got upgraded to first class, me and my wife. And the whole way there, the Holy Spirit was speaking to me about how we're going to make disciples. So I started talking to the Lord. How many of you, you know you could talk to God and He will answer? God is not oblivious God. God is not too far away from you. If you start speaking to Him in your heart, He will speak to you through your thoughts. He will speak to you. So I started talking to God. Lord, how are we going to make the difference in Lake Mary? I don't even live in Lake Mary. I, I don't know how we're going to do this. And the verse that started hitting me, you're supposed to be fisher of men. Jesus told Peter that I'm going to make you a fisher of men. I says, Lord, if I'm going to be a fisher of men, I don't have a fishing pond. I mean, I need a fishing pond in Lake Mary. Where do I go meet people that we could build this church and make disciples? 
So on an international flight, if you are on an international flight in the first class, there's internet access. So I logged on the internet and I start looking up all the clubs in Lake Mary. Now, I know we have a bunch of people here from Lake Mary, right? And Lake Mary have a lot of clubs, like the Ferrari clubs and the Maserati clubs. I'm like, I can't belong to any of these clubs. So the deal is this. I said, Lord, whatever club in Lake Mary that have the most member, I'm going to belong there and I'm going to go meet people. I'm going to build relationships and let you do the rest. So I'm looking at all the clubs and I got very discouraged because all these clubs were small and you have to sell one of your kids to belong. So, you know, I was like, this is not going to happen. I'm about to log off. And I saw on the bottom, it says 11,000 members. I said, 11,000 members? What kind of club is that? I click on it, and it says Lifestyle Family Fitness. I said, wow, I know where that gym is. I know exactly where that gym is. So I looked at my wife and said, guess what? Guess where we're going to start working out? We're going to go to Lifestyle Family Fitness. She said, we have membership in the gym next to the house, and you never go. You're going to drive 30 minutes? I said, I'm going to go work out there. She said, you're not going to go work out there? I said, no, I'm not going to go work out. I'm going to go work it out. So I start going to the gym and I start camping there. Now, I didn't have the money to pay the, the fees. So we, you know, Middle Eastern, we're cool. We're cool. You know, we stick together. So right next to the gym, right next to the gym, there's a shoe repair uh, place there. And they're from our Arabic ministry. So I went there and said, I need to get a membership there says, Pastor, don't worry about it. I know the manager. I'll get you in there for free. I said, really? He said, yeah, I'll talk to him. See, that's a Middle Eastern thing, you know. We negotiate everything. You got to be free to feel right about it. So, uh, I mean, if you're going to work out, at least it'll be free. So, he got me in the club, and um, he talked to the manager, and he gave me like a 90 days pass or something like that. Now, I start going to the gym, and I spend like four to five hours a day in the gym. You could tell I've been spending four to five hours a day in the gym, right? I was working my upper body right here. I know from where you see it, you could not see it. It's right there. You know, I start working on my upper body a lot. I start talking to everybody, just building relationships, speaking, Lord, who's here? Who's here? Who's here? Because the Holy Spirit says this, that we are co-labor with God. It means this, God is already working in somebody's heart. And when we ask him for direction, we could labor with God. We could not change the heart of man, but only God can change the heart of man. So if we could labor with God, God will lead you. So make a long story short, I start getting to know the manager there. He was a cocky, haughty, prouder than earth. I mean, he's just full of, huh, I'm a successful guy. And he was. To all his credit, I walked in his office. And I saw this picture. They're going to show you in a second. It's, I saw I have two pictures of this bodybuilding guy on the wall. So I would start sitting there and talking to him a little bit and just chatting with him, getting to know him, building the bridge of relationship. And over time, we start getting to know one another. Now, I did not tell him I'm a pastor. You know, once you tell people you're a pastor, they look at you funny. They start treating you funny. It's like, yeah, yeah, you're a pastor, yeah. I once used to live next to a church. You know, you, they don't know what to tell you. You know, yeah, you're a pastor. I remember that. So I didn't tell him anything. So we just start building the relationship. I got start getting to know him. He asked me about the Middle East. He served in the military. So we have some stuff in common. But this guy had a very short vocabulary. When you talk to him, if the sentence is four words, three of them were cuss words. His vocabulary was just one of these very fun to be around sometimes and it's just you feel like oh I can't talk like that but he was very much himself and I liked how gutsy he is he was one of these people that you know if God touch his heart he will be a world changer he looked right from the outside he had the track record of amazing success he drove the right car he was married the right girl i mean everything from the outside looked just perfect but you know we all put a nice front usually the inside is where the renovation need to take place and he desperately needed that now pastor david houston is sitting right up front here he's our church planning coach or consulting he taught us something amazing he said start a vip list on your phone 
very important people that you'll be praying for every day. These are the people that you believe in God for radical change in their life. These are the people that you believe in God, that God will do an amazing thing. So I put that manager's name on my phone and I start praying for him, for God to open up doors and for him to say the right things and God to lead. As I start speaking to this guy, I walked in his office one time and he have all these pictures of bodybuilding. I'm trying to have a conversation with him. I walked in there, looked at these pictures, said, wow, nice Photoshop. This guy got mad. His face got red. He got angry, he said, Photoshop blankety blank. What do you think? I'm going to put a Photoshop in my office. I manage these facilities. I was a bodybuilder for that many years. I, I, you know, and he went on and said, What happened? Now, you know, that did not go well. <laughs> I thought he's going to punch me. So he said, I'll show you what happened. He starts rolling his sleeve. And he says, this is what happened. And he have a hole in his arm right here. He said, what happened? He said, I was taking steroids to, to do all this. And I was working so hard, I blew up the muscle. It took seven surgery to give me my arm use again I was like wow and I looked at him and I said was that what you wanted to do with the rest of your life and he looked at me and gave me the perfect answer he said no that's not what I want to do with my life I said what do you want to do with your life and he looked at me and he gave me this you know cliche answer but he was sincere this is what he said he says I want to be the father that I never had and the husband that my mom never had I said that say that again he said I want to be the father that my I never had and the husband that my mom never had I said wow we start talking and he starts sharing a little bit about his family and God used the miraculous power to transform this man from the inside out to the point that we start meeting to disciple him. He's going to share the rest of the story with you. This is segment one. You wait for segment two. But when I start meeting with him to disciple him, he was so hungry for the truth. See, you could know God and you could know about God, but the truth never pen penetrated your heart and it means nothing to you. You could come to five of these and ten of these and you keep coming back, but the truth never really made it inside of here. But this guy was ready for the truth to just go right through him. He was hungry for God. We start talking. A few months goes back and this guy gets radically saved. In his one year anniversary of being radically saved, I took him with me to the Philippines. He received the word from God that he's going to be full-time ministry. He came back. Pastor Jim Lafon told him, wait, don't do it yet. He waited almost another year. Then God called him to the full-time ministry. Today he is three years in the Lord, full-time on five high school campuses, bringing thousands of people to the Lord because he allowed God, he allowed God to enter into his heart, remove the old, heal him from the destructive lifestyle that he lived, and he allowed God to make him a world changer. Today, he is changing the world, not because of him, but because the Holy Spirit flew through him to others. See, this is what God is looking for, vessels of honor, just a vessel, just a vessel. He says, if you allowed me in, I'm going to flow right through you. So tonight, I want you to meet my good friend, amazing vessel of honor, Tom Burkwall. Tom, come on up here. What's up? You know, it's, in all fairness, it's, it's a lot easier when you have such an amazing man of God that pursues you and continues to pick you up when you fall and give you the right guidance and the right wisdom. So Pastor Shaddy, thank you wherever you went because, you know, you're, you're amazing and, and I thank you for cha helping change my life. So today, the, 
the bottom line to my message is what's your identity? And I know many of you think you know what identity means. And when I say that, some things will come to mind. But I want to focus on the three top definitions in the dictionary so we can really narrow down what we're going to talk about today. So the first definition is, is who someone is, the name of a person. So who you are, driver's license, birth certificate, will help show wherever you go your true identity. Nobody can go on an airplane without a passport or a driver's license, right? So that photo helps create your identity. The second one is the qualities and the beliefs, etc., that separate you from other people. So your qualities, your beliefs that make you different will help form your identity. And the third is the distinguishing character or personality traits that separate you from others. So before we start in the message, I want to take a couple minutes and ask you all a couple questions. And when I ask these questions, I don't want it to be something that you really think about. I want it to be the first one or two words that come to your mind. You ready? The first one is this. Who are you? What's your identity? When you hear your name, what are the first one or two words that come to your mind? What are your qualities and beliefs that separate you from others? And what are your distinguishing character or personality traits that make you different than other people? And now I want to do a little flip to this question. How about the people on your campus? How about not your best friends, but just the people that know you? When they hear your name, what one or two words instantly come to their mind? What would they say your qualities and beliefs are that help separate you and distinguish you from other people? And what would they say those character and personality traits are that make you different? You see, there's many things that will shape our identity over life. The sports teams we play on, the schools we go to, our families, our friends, our enemies. Everything will have a big part in shaping who we are. And the reason why this is such an important message to me is because most of my life was centered around trying to find my identity. You see, at a very young age, like this big, my identity was shaken. I didn't really know who I was. I thought I was an outcast. I thought I didn't fit in. You see, I grew up in a family of five. I had an older brother and three younger sisters, and both my parents were alcoholics. And my mom, every time she would get drunk, she would tell me that I was a mistake and that she wished she never had me. So imagine being this big when your mom gets drunk, coming up to you and telling you you're a mistake and wish they didn't have you. That hurt. That did some damage. That didn't go away for a long time. My dad, every time he had an opportunity to tell me I wasn't good enough, he did it. Whether it was at the dinner table, on the sport field, just sitting down, I never met the expectations of him. I was never good enough. I was always getting made fun of. So at a very young age, I was the outcast. My identity was the outcast. The one that doesn't fit in. But here's the good news. See, I played a lot of hockey. And it was good. And when you can hit people five or six days a week and score goals, it's really easy to vent that frustration, which is kind of why I still play hockey. But anyways, so I was with other families. I was with other people five or six days a week. And when you're good at a sport, all the parents like you because you make their, teams, their kids' team good. So I got that affirmation. I got that good job. I was popular in school. But there was still something inside of me that was hurting. You know, my identity at that age was that I was going to be a professional hockey player. That was the only thing that I could hold on to. That was the only thing that can keep me getting good grades, not touching drugs or alcohol, and just staying focused on what I needed to do. 
But then unfortunately, that whole dream went away. See, after my eighth grade year, my family decided to move from New York to Florida. And I don't know the last time you saw a lake frozen in Florida, but I haven't. When I, where I lived was Palm Coast, Florida. There were three hockey rinks in Florida back then. Now there's probably about 14. The nearest one was two hours away. So if you and your dad don't get along, I don't think he's going to want to put you in the car and drive you two hours. So my one outlet, the one thing that could help me get through what I was going through was gone. So my freshman year, I started in a brand new school, not knowing anybody. And something happened that never happened before in school. I didn't fit in. See, people in Florida dress differently. In New York, you didn't care. Maybe because it's nicer and people wear less in Florida. I don't know, but they dress differently. They look differently. And I remember the first couple of days, I actually started to get picked on. And now that weight of what was going on at home was starting to really get bad because I had nowhere to get rid of it. And I didn't know what to do or where to go. So I started to try to be cool, right? To do everything I needed to do to fit in. Started smoking weed, started drinking. I was a pathological liar. If I had a black shirt on, I would have told you it was yellow. I lied about everything because when your own family at this age doesn't accept you, who is? Who is going to accept you being you? Who is going to accept you if you don't make up this story because obviously your story isn't good enough? So as I started to steal, lie, have sex, you name it, whatever was bad, I did it. My GPA instantly dropped too low to play any sports. And I was living a life of self-medication. I was living a life of trying to feed something that was so far down that I never wanted to face. Kind of tell you how unfair it was. I would get locked out of my house and stay on the patio outside overnight. My brother or sisters got jobs and cars. I never got anything because I was told I wasn't good enough. My junior year, I couldn't take it anymore and I moved out. I ended up moving in with my best friend, Tony, and I started living with him. And as I was living with him, you know, he gave me all the clothes and I got to fit in and I, I was cool, but I still didn't know what was going on. I still would sit there at night and just hurt inside saying, where did I go wrong? Towards the end of my junior year, I realized it was getting worse at home. You see, when you have an alcoholic mom and she's face first somewhere and beer cans everywhere, whatever, everywhere, you know, when you're in high school, you get out of school before your little sisters do. So my little sisters would come home and see something that they never even knew existed. So I ended up moving back home. I said, it's better let me deal with it all. Let me be the outcast. Let me be the one that doesn't fit in. And let me give them an opportunity to be who they should be. Well, senior year came around, and everyone's signing yearbooks. I didn't have money to buy a yearbook. And everyone's all excited about the colleges they're going to. And as I'm sitting here, I realize the decisions I made that I can't go to college. None of them said, hey, Tom, come with me. None of them said, I'm not going to college. I'm staying with you. No. You see, I thought my identity was my high school friends. I thought they were my family. I thought they loved me. I thought they needed me. But the truth is this, when it was their time to go, they didn't really care where I went. By the grace of God, about a month or two before School ended, I got a letter from University of Northern Florida. Where's all my University of Northern Florida at? Man, I love you guys. I love you guys. You guys took someone with a lower than a 2.0 GPA, absolutely didn't behave, was absolutely terrible, but you accepted me. So thank you. You're my alma mater, kind of. Let me go further. But, so the rule was this, I was accepted on academic probation. What that, oh, some of you said, oh, you probably know what that means. What that means is the first semester of the summer, 
you have to go and take two classes. And my two classes they actually pick for you are art appreciation and sociology. So I was excited. I'm going to college, and not only was I excited, guess what? So was my family. See, I was the first Breckwalt to get accepted to college. I was the first Breckwalt that was going to a university. I earned all my parents' respect. They were so proud of me, they told everybody. My dad bought me a car, even though it was a beat up car, and my brothers and sisters got new ones. It was still a car. I was still happy. I still drove it up there. It was like an 89 Oldsmobile, and that was back in 98. But it was cool. The roof was falling off, but I loved it. I loved it. You know, you took like push pins to push it up. But here I am going to college. I'm in a dorm. They bought me a meal plan, and I am finally a success. Well, I only knew one way to fit in. I only knew one way to be cool, right? So the first thing I do is I meet my roommate, and I got to be cool. You smoke? Yeah, you drink? Cool. Let's go find everyone else that does it. My room becomes the party room. And now it's centered again around doing everything wrong to make me feel right. It's centered around doing everything to hide the pain that I'm not willing to face. I knew sociology would be hard, art, art appreciation, forget about it. So I really studied as hard as I could for sociology when I was sober. And at the end of the first term of, of summer, I got my grade from sociology, and it was an A. So I was so excited, I'm going to college. My art appreciation grade, you had to draw this still life thing and turn it in and do all this stuff, was going to be mailed home with my acceptance letter. So I went home with that A. I told my mom and dad, look at A. And A, that was me. The, the other one's art appreciation, whatever, right? And I remember I was in my room. And I remember hearing my dad in the kitchen read a letter. And it says, dear Mr. Breckwalt, we regret to inform you that due to your D in art appreciation, you will not be accepted into the University of Northern Florida. We wish you the best of luck with your future endeavors. I remember hearing my dad laughing, saying I knew it was too good to be true. Came in, kind of gave me the letter, gave me a trash bag, and said he got five minutes to get out of my house. So I threw all my stuff in my trash bag, and here I was. I had nowhere to go. The one person I knew still lived there was the guy we got all of our weed from. He was about five or six years older than me. So I moved in with him. He lived in a one-bedroom duplex. There were about four other guys that lived there, five, five of us total. I slept on the floor. Started going out to clubs, Daytona Beach, 600 North, was hanging out there all the time, met some people that were about 10 years older than me, got introduced to a drug called ecstasy. I took a drug, and guess what? I forgot everything. There was no more hurt. I felt like I was floating in the air, really. And I found something stronger to help me cope with the stuff I'm not ready to face yet. I started robbing people. I started going to my house when my mom would be passed out, pretending I was going to say hi to my sisters, but I'd go rummaging through my mom's purse and all of the things, take quarters, take whatever. I would roll change and bring them to the drug dealer every Friday night, and I would stay with him Friday and Saturday, and I would get whatever drugs I could with the money that I had. And then one day he said to me, he said, Tom, I see you're struggling. I said, yeah. He said, you want to get your drugs for free? And I said, yeah. Heck yeah. He said, okay, this is what you'll do. I'll give you 600 pills a week. Three packs of 200. You break them up into 10, 20, 30, 40, and 50 packs. Bring 300 up on Friday to the club, 300 up on Saturday. You'll stand in the back of VIP, one for 10, two for 20, three for 34. You know the drill, and well, you probably don't, but I do. And he said, We'll just give you that symbol and you get rid of the drugs. And now I was like, really? He said, yeah, and after that you get to eat as many of them as you want the rest of the night. So I was excited. This is awesome. I got to a point where I would start to eat 10 pills of ecstasy on a Friday night and a Saturday night. I never collected any money. I was just the do boy. But I was needed. But I was important. But my identity was something. All I wanted was to be accepted. 
All I wanted was to fit in. So that's what I started doing. Six months into it, the duplex I was living at, my buddies were smoking a blunt in the room, and, and I was right around the front door, and all of a sudden my buddies opened the door, and in came the cops. The cop put me up against the wall. They all took off toward the room where they were smoking, telling them all to get on the ground. They left me, so I go to run outside because I just did a pickup. I had 600 pills in my pocket, three packs of 200. I go to run outside. There's more cops. I don't know what to do. I'm frantic. I start freaking out. My entire life is now in front of my face. I end up going into the kitchen, taking off the garbage can. Inside the garbage, there's a McDonald's bag. I open the McDonald's bag. There's three Big Mac containers. I take one, put them each in a Big Mac container, close the McDonald's bag, put it back in the garbage, and now's the waiting game. And as all the cops are searching the house, they finally get to the garbage. They take off the top of the garbage. They open the McDonald's bag. They take out the three Big Mac containers. And at this point, I'm praying to a God. I don't even know who he is. You know, we've all done that before. Saying, if, this, if I don't get in trouble for this, I will never do it again. And they never opened the McDonald's bag, the Big Mac containers. We had a dog, so there's trash everywhere. So I said to the cop, I said, officer, there's trash everywhere. Can I just throw it in a trash bag just so the dog doesn't need all the trash? He's like, go for it. I said, all right, the dumpster's right across the street. So I throw those pills into the dumpster, and I'm like, I can't believe I got away with it. Second they left, I totally forgot that prayer, and there I was again, diving in that dumpster like is a tithing board. Took those pills, went up to 600 North, told everybody about my genius plan, how the cops can't even get me, and my life continued down the path of destruction. Six months after that, it's the summer after my senior year. All of my buddies are back from college, and we're drinking at a party. I pass out. I'm walking up in the middle of the night to a girl holding a butcher knife over my face. My best friend's holding her hand saying that I raped her. They called the cops. My buddy said, Tom, let's go. The cops are coming. I said, let's go. So where are we going to take you, Tom? You see, when you're that kid that your own parents don't like, nobody else's parents like you. So I wasn't allowed to go to their house. I said, I don't know. Take me home. And they took me home, and I knocked on the door. My dad answered. I haven't talked to him in over a year. And I said, Dad, I've been accused of something I didn't do. And he said, what? And I told him. A girl said I raped her, and he let me in the house. Hours went by. Next thing you know, ding dong. Four cop cars outside my house. Put me on the floor, put me in handcuffs. Take me to jail for two counts of sexual battery, which is rape. It's a nice word for rape. Here I am, 18 year, 19 years old, turned 19 in April, so just turned 19. Here I am sitting behind bars with a $35,000 bail, sitting there saying, where did my life go wrong? In middle school, I wouldn't even touch a drug. Now look at me, five years later, and I'm sitting behind bars possibly for the rest of my life. I was scared, I was hurt, I didn't know what was going on. My dad ended up bailing me out a couple weeks later, got me an attorney. The attorney said, the DEA knows you're involved in the drug game, Tom. You need to lay low as we do this investigation. You cannot leave your house or talk to anybody outside of your house. I said, okay. Well, you see, the problem with that was my identity at home changed. See, I wasn't called a mistake anymore when my mom got drunk. I was called a rapist. Every time she got drunk, she would tell me that I was a rapist. My little sisters, who I tried to hide everything from, came home bawling their eyes out saying, Tommy, is it true? You see, because when you're over 18, guess what goes in the newspaper? So the entire town labeled me a rapist. Anywhere I went, with my family to the store or whatever, everybody looked at me. About seven months into it, they ended up dropping all the charges. Girl admitted to lying. She ended up getting arrested. And I was set to go. Well, at this point, I was done. I said, get me out of here. United States Navy, here I come. I went, and I took the ASVAB. I enlisted in the military. They said, when do you want to leave? I said, yesterday. They said, what job do you want? I said, the quickest one to get me out of here before I change my mind. 
They put me in the three, the, the late entry program. Three months later, I was gone, full speed ahead. And now I was a part of something that was a success. Now I was a part of a family. You see, those drill instructors that were making everyone else cry, want to run away, want to kill themselves, I was like, push-ups, let's go, sit-ups, let's go. You want to run? How fast? I loved it because I got all the attention. You see, all I wanted was attention. All I wanted was to fit in so I would do all the wrong things because it still got me that attention. So I started excelling in the military. I graduated in the front of my division in boot camp. I was the top of my class. I stood in the front. My parents were there. My dad had the proud dad of the United States Navy. My mom had a proud mom shirt. They had the bumper sticker, you name it. And I graduated the top of my class. Went through two years of special op schoolings, all of these different types of training to get me ready to be an air crewman, rescue swimmer. I was graduating my last school right here in NAS Jacksonville. Jacksonville again. The next day I was graduating, then I was going on leave for 45 days, which is like a vacation. My best friend Tony came up the night before, we went off base, we got drunk, he took out a pipe and said, you wanna smoke? I said, weed stays in your system for 30 days, I'm going on leave for 45, let's smoke. We smoke, we come back across base, they're doing a random search on cars, it was right after September 11th, they find the pipe, they drug test me, it was positive. The next day my family showed up with the poster boards and everything, and I was in the Navy jail. I ended up getting put on something called restriction, waiting to go to captain's mass, which is like going in front of the judge, that's the captain in the military. And I went in front of him and I cried my eyes out, and the master chief who was with me the whole time said, sir, you don't know what he's been through. If he could have one more chance, he could stay with me and my family the rest of my career, which never happens. And the captain looked at me and said, Airman Breckwalt, I'm sorry, but it's zero tolerance in the Navy. Effective immediately, you're discharged. I remember walking off that Navy base with another trash bag, realizing the choices that I made, realizing the decision that I made cost me my career. I didn't smoke weed every day in the Navy. I smoked it once. One time. See, many of you look at life as a one-time event. You say, oh, I'll do this today, whatever. You only live once, but you don't know what that one time will cost you. You don't know what that one time will do to your life. Just like those of you that smoke weed and drink, oh, it's little. Yeah, that's what a lot of people think about sin. But you know what? When you let a little bit of sin in your life, you open the door for a lot of sin to take you over. You open up the opportunities for the enemy to take you down. And that's what he did to me. At this point, I hit rock bottom. I was done. I didn't want to live anymore. I started doing massive amounts of cocaine. I would combine drugs that they said would kill you. I started selling a lot of cocaine. I started taking a ton of steroids, building this person on the outside. I started working as a personal trainer at a gym. I told everybody I was a Navy SEAL, everybody, that I got hurt in Iraq, and I made up all these stories because who's going to accept me if I wasn't accepted at this age? Who's going to want me to be their friend? Who's going to marry me? Who's going to do anything if my own family doesn't like me. So I made up this huge story. I had all, almost all certificates. I did a lot of their training. So I got a job immediately. I started getting a lot of clients and personal training because everyone wants to work out with a Navy SEAL. I would get to work at five in the morning. I would leave at 10 at night. People would be like, dude, you Navy SEALs are crazy. No, the truth is I had no power or I had no electricity. I mean, no water at my house, at my apartment I lived in. I would go home and do drugs all night. So yeah, I wanted a shower, I wanted air conditioning, so it was way better being at work than being somewhere else. I started to compete in bodybuilding, and this is the picture that Pastor Shadi was talking about. I was pretty enormous. My legs were bigger, but I was wearing like a Speedo, so it's not really good to show. <laughs> but that was me. The biggest guy in the gym, the strongest guy in the gym, Got whatever girl I wanted, everyone wanted to be like me. 
But the truth is this, when I was my biggest on the outside, I was my most broken on the inside. I built this outer person because I needed to be accepted. I built this outer person so people wouldn't know what goes on inside of here. See, many of you are sitting here right now, ladies, let me talk to you real quick. You show more skin than you do clothes. Let's just call it like it is. And you do it because there's something in here that's broken. Guys, you put on these fronts. You act like you're tough. You lie about 95% of the stuff you say. And the truth is this, because you're not willing to face what's deep down inside of here. So you build this person. We one-up everybody. We act like we're better, and we continue on this path because we won't deal with what's on the inside. I did th blow out my bicep. It is right there. That's what Pastor Shaddy was talking about. I started working for a company called Lifestyle Family Fitness. Started to make $120,000 a year. Had the BMW 335, black on black, black limo tint. I missed that car. But $786 a month wasn't the right way to go. I would drive that car, and when I would pull it up into a parking spot, if I was going to the store right here, but there were more people over there, I would drive it all the way to there where they were so I could get out of my car so they could see me. That was the attention that I wanted. That was what I needed. I broke every record in our company. I was a huge success. I ended up getting married to my wife, Ashley, who's always been an angel, never did anything wrong, ever. Whenever we fight, it's my fault, not hers. I wasn't, in God's honest truth, babe, if you're watching, I love you. I'm sorry, but, but I wasn't the greatest husband. You see, if I couldn't make myself right, how can I make someone else right? If I couldn't be happy with me, how could I be happy with someone else? So I was a pretty bad husband the first couple years. Fast forward about three years ago. This Egyptian dude comes in on a pass. <laughs> and when he tells you that he's cheap, I just got to tell you a real quick story real quick. We went to the Philippines, and we went to go buy something. And he made this lady give us something for so cheap, I gave her all the money out of my pocket because of how bad he made me feel. But he comes and joins the gym on this third... I gave him a nine month, a three month pass, 90 days, because the shoe place right next to me knew him and they shined my shoes. They were just amazing. So he comes and starts talking to me. He never talked to me about God. Never. He became my friend. He would come in and spend five, ten minutes with me and just talk and built this relationship. And he's right, I did throw a lot of F-bombs out there. I didn't care if he was a pastor. It didn't meant nothing to me. He was in my house, in my gym. And as we built this relationship together, I really started to respect him. You see, he thought I was a Navy SEAL too. He didn't want to say that, but I told him I was a Navy SEAL. I did. I told my wife I was a Navy SEAL, her whole family. This is a lie that I started from the age of 22 that carried till three years ago. Everybody thought I was a Navy SEAL. And I knew a lot about it, so we would talk. And then one day he came in, and he said, I don't know why I'm telling you this, but I feel I have to tell you. And I said, okay, tell me. He said, I was praying for this teacher at Lake Mary High School, and I got a word from the Holy Spirit that they were pregnant. So I told him, and he said, there's no way, Pastor. Um, we took care of that problem. We can only have two kids. And he said, take a pregnancy test, and they did, and they were pregnant. So I don't know why I'm telling you that, Tom, but I feel led to tell you that. Well, what he didn't know at the time was because of all the steroids I took, I shut down my reproductive system. I can't have children. When I told him I wanted to be that father I never had and the husband my mom never had, that was my goal since I was 18 years old. I'll never forget the day when I was told that I can't have kids. I'll never forget how hard that hit me because of the choices and decisions that I made in the past, how it now would affect my future. You see, many of you are so young. You're so young, and you make decisions every day. And every decision you make can affect your future. 
Every single move, every decision, everything you do can affect where you're going to be when you're my age. So when he told me that, I said, you really believe in that stuff, man? And I told him my story. And he said, Tom, the fruit of the womb is of the Lord. You need to lay your hands on your wife's stomach and say the prayer of miracles. It's going to happen. I said, well, I've never prayed, so will you text that to me? (laughs) So I gave him my number, and he texted it to me. And I went home, and I picked up a 12-pack, and I drank it, and I smoked a blunt, and I told my wife to lay down, and I put my hand on her stomach, and I looked at that thing, and I said that prayer of miracles, baby. I said it. I spoke it the best I could. And nothing happened. Are you surprised? Because if you are surprised, we're going to pray for you after. But as I said that prayer, I completely forgot it. Probably because I was wasted. I probably didn't put a couple words in there right because I couldn't see straight. And months went by. Four or five months later, my wife and I started to go to fertility doctors. We started to do all this stuff to, to see if we could even have kids. And we were, she was about to start all this medication. I was about to start all this medication, trying to give it one more try before we look into other areas. And my phone rang, and it was... Pastor Shaddy. And I didn't answer it because I didn't really know him that good. He's not that important, and we're trying to take care of something really important. And my wife had to take a pregnancy test before she would start medication because if she was pregnant, the medication could harm or kill the baby. And the pregnancy test came back positive. (laughs) That was a Friday morning. Monday morning, Pastor Shaddy comes into the gym. And I look at him and I say, what did you call me for? He goes, don't worry about it, I did my job. I said, no, what'd you call me for? He said, Tom, don't, I said, get in my office and tell me what you called me for. He goes, okay. (laughs) Okay, dude, cool. And he said, sit down. And he said, I was praying for you Friday morning and the Holy Spirit told me to call you and tell you to tell your wife not to start any medication because she's pregnant with a baby boy. Right then, something started to turn inside of my heart. Something that I can't even describe. I started to drip with sweat. I was sitting there wondering what was going on. I didn't know much about Jesus, but I knew he was from the Middle East. And this dude's from the Middle East. So so I kind of thought Jesus was coming back, and I was scared because I wasn't going to heaven. And I'm sitting there freaking out, and he's working out, and I'm like, what is going on? How do I accept this Jesus? Because I need to go to, I need to go with him. And then he walked in my office. And he said to me, he said, do you want your son to turn out like you? And then everything flashed in front of my eyes. Everything I've ever done. And I started to realize I blamed my dad for everything. But I was bringing a child into this world with a far worse dad than I had. And I started bawling, and I said, no, he doesn't deserve it. And he said, you'll meet with me once a week. And before we go forward, you could see a picture. Not only did God give me one, he gave me two. It was a boy. That is little Tommy. And that is my beautiful daughter, Hannah Faith. Tommy turned one, I mean three on Monday. Hannah will turn one on the 4th of March. And he started to meet with me. And he told me a lot of stuff that was so interesting. He was right. I was like a sponge. We'd meet for an hour and I'd be like, we can't, we can't stop. Let's keep going. Keep telling me. I need to know more. I need to understand a lot of this. And he started to teach things to me. He told me about generational stuff. And he said, that's why you fill out doctor's Notes in, in school, and when you go to the doctors, you fill out family history because chances are you could have the same things your family has. Well, spiritually, it's the same stuff. And it all started to make sense to me, and I started to just chew it up. I was like, this stuff is awesome. Keep telling me, keep telling me. Just There was a transformation that was going on inside of my heart. And then he told me in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone, and a new life has begun. And he looked at me and he said, Tom, you can have a new life. 
He said, you can have a fresh start. Do you want that? And I said, I want it bad. I said, I'm tired of carrying around this Tom. I'm tired of carrying around this suitcase full, suitcase full of stuff from when I was this age. I'm tired of tucking it in. I'm tired of trying to find exterior stuff to help medicate all of it. I'm trying to, tired of trying to build this image of who I'm not. I want to be new. How do I do it? And then he started to talk to me. And he told me, Tom, you do have a dad. You have a dad that loves you so much. Matter of fact, he loves you so much, Tom, that he gave his only son for you. And that his name was Jesus. And as I started to learn more about Jesus, and I started to understand that there was this perfect person who never ever made a mistake, who never did anything wrong, and took my place. And as I learned more about it, to hear as Jesus walked the earth, all the amazing things that he did. But then he was arrested. And as he was arrested, he was tortured. Tortured to a point that we can't even fathom. Whipped, things that pulled his flesh out that went straight to his muscle. Kicked in the face, put a, thorn, a crown of thorns over his head that were deep enough to hit the nerve endings in his brain. So every time he made a face or he did anything, his entire body would radiate with pain. And then he carried a cross. And he carried this cross. And he fell and he got kicked and he got spit at and he kept getting up and kept carrying this cross. And then he laid on the cross. And then with one hand he took a nail. How many times they hit it, who knows? And he took another nail. And then they took his legs. And they put it in between it all. And then they stood him up. And as he stood up, that pain must have just, we can't even fathom it. And he said this, forgive them, Father, for they do not know. This Savior that took it all for us at the end told him, forgive them for they don't know. And he did it all for us. He carried that cross for us. He died on that cross for us. And on the third day he rose again, proving that he was the Son of God. And the Word of God says, anyone that calls on the name of Jesus will be saved. Anyone that calls on the name of Jesus will be saved. You see, many of you may have raised your hand in a church going or something and said, yeah, I'm ready. And your life continued down the same path. The only thing you felt was that one event and then you continued going back down the wrong way. See, when I found out about this Jesus, I gave it all in. I surrendered it all. The day I heard about it, October 31st, three years ago, I gave it all to him. I said to Pastor Shaddy, what do I need to do? He said, get involved in life groups and church. I didn't miss a beat. Was it what I wanted to do? No, I'll be honest, it was boring in the beginning. I'll be honest. Because it's completely different than what was fun to me. But I wanted the life that they had. I wanted how they live. I wanted their marriage. I wanted to be a dad to their, they are their kids. I wanted that relationship. So you know what? I went with boring and I kept pursuing it. And I was relentless and I never turned away. Every morning, I'm up at five in the morning for an hour and a half reading the Word of God since the day I got saved. And I kept going in and going in and going in and then guess what happened? It became fun. It became exciting. It became real. It became better than any drug that I've ever put in my body. Jesus became alive. The Holy Spirit started rocking my world. See, many of you are here and you're not all in. Many of you are here and you're hearing messages and you're going right back to the same way. Who do you want to be like? 
What do you want your marriage to be like? What do you want your family to be like? Don't you understand the decisions you make today will determine your future? So I want to give every one of you an opportunity tonight. I want to give you an opportunity to be all in. I want to give you an opportunity to say, you know what? Maybe I've raised my hand before, but you know what? Maybe I didn't really mean it with my heart. Maybe my life didn't even shift a little bit. And tonight you have an opportunity to do that. And you also have an opportunity to do something else. See, if I didn't surrender to Jesus, I wouldn't have been who I am today. But if I also didn't forgive, I wouldn't be who I am today. You see, the, the root of unforgiveness is what the fruit you're all dealing with, the insecurities, the addictions, it's all because there's something that hurt you at one point in your life that you're not willing to let go of. Something that when I'm talking about it, it's coming to mind right now and the pain is already starting to build up. But the Bible says in Scripture, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, Neither will your father forgive your trespasses. You see, unforgiveness causes a block. It doesn't allow you to experience the fullness of God. It doesn't allow you to experience the radical transformation that he has waiting for you. That Jesus that carried that cross forgives you and forgave you and will always forgive you. Why can't we forgive others? So we're going to do something in a minute before we do. All y'all that need to hear this, I want you to listen to it. It was the Holy Spirit speaking it to me. God loves you. He loves you so much. He loves everything about you. He loves right where you are. He loves all the things that you're doing. Even if you feel you're not living up to his standards, he wants you to know he loves you. If you take a $100 bill and crinkle it up, and you have one that's completely crisp and you put them next to each other, they're both worth $100. One of them's not more valuable than the other. Well, wherever you're at right now, no matter how wrinkled and how crinkled you are, today you have an opportunity to lay it down at the altar. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to play some worship music. And I'm going to pray, but as the worship music comes up, if you want to be all in, I want you to start coming forward. And it's going to take boldness for the first couple to do it. But don't look to your left and look to your right. Look to Jesus. If you have that person inside of your heart that you haven't forgiven, thank you. I want you to come to the altar. And I want you to come up and declare today that today's a new start. Today's a new beginning. Today I'm going to experience freedom. Father God, we cry out right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for what you did on the cross. We thank you for taking our place. Father, let tonight be a night that your spirit moves. Sweep through this room. Let every knee bow and every tongue confess your name. We cry out to you right now, Holy Spirit. I speak to every chain and every bondage, and I say be broken in the name of Jesus. I speak to every root of unforgiveness and I say be uprooted in the name of Jesus we love you Lord and just keep coming down if you need to come down and you want to say today you're all in